I wanted to kind of do something lighthearted because it's been a it's been a rough weekend. Um, uh, yeah. For me personally, <laughs> um, yeah. I had some family stuff. My, my daughter was ill and her fiance just got COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm it was a rough. Yeah, we had we started out with this great celebration. We were going to do a celebration and then um, it went well on Friday, but then she was quite ill and had to go to the hospital. She's OK now, but oh, well, um, good. yeah. But it's been a, it's been a, and then all the news that came forward and I wanted to give you my condolences for your friend and your, um, colleague, uh, Daria yeah. Dugan. Um, thank you very much. That was, uh, so shocking. Um, and I was wondering if you could, um, well, Reef, if you could put up Alexander Dugan, who was her father, um, his mm -hmm. statement for the audience to see. Um, but Daria, for those of you who may not know, uh, was um, a victim of a assassination by the SBU. Allegedly, mm -hmm. um, that's what's come out from the SP FSB from their investigation. They've said that it was Ukraine SBU that yeah. uh, there was a car bomb. So if you want to talk a little bit more about this, Don, because you actually did a report on it. So, yeah, sure. Uh, well, the first thing I want to say is that. Uh... I never knew that I'd understand the feeling of what it felt like to wake up in the morning and see, open the news and see someone that, you know, you knew personally well, mm -hmm. you know, she wasn't an acquaintance. She wasn't one of my closest friends, but I had just uh, seen her less than a month ago. And we were talking about how great it was that she had brought some uh, anti-imperialists from, from a French speaking African country to Russia to discuss closer cooperation between the two countries. And all of a sudden I woke up one morning and, you know, there she was in the news. She, her, it, it, not only was she killed, but like her body was burnt beyond recognition. It's a horrifying thing to, to wake up to. Um, basically what happened. And of course I can, I can talk about it because uh, everyone at work, uh, I did a report out on it at work. Everyone there knows that uh, I knew her personally. Um, Basically, she was at a, a mu like a, a music and literature festival with with, with her father. Sorry about that, <laughs> my cat. Okay. Uh, they were at a music and literature festival uh, together, where her father was giving a talk, and she was also uh, participating. And at the very last moment, her dad decided to take uh, a car, a different car, rather than the one he usually drives around, which everyone knows is his. And Daria decided that she was going to drive to wherever she wanted to drive, uh, I guess I'm assuming home, uh, in this car that Alexander Dugan, her father, usually drives in. And it turns out there was a bomb planted under the driver's side of that car, which is uh, what ended up killing her. Now, uh, today, uh, the official investigation from the FSB came out, and they, uh, they identified the, the, the assassins. It was actually a 43-year-old woman named uh, Natalia Volk, who was a Ukrainian citizen. Uh, and there are, um, I don't know if this has been confirmed yet, but there are documents circulating around the internet that uh, are allegedly hers. And if they are, then that would mean, if, if they can be connected back to this person, then she, that would mean that she was an agent of the Ukrainian Secret Services, which the FSB has already independently verified and a member of the Azov neo-Nazi battalion. And when I looked at this information, it looked to me pretty, it looked pretty clear to me that these documents were, um, were legit. And it's possible that they were already verified um, earlier today or in the, in the last hour or, or whatever. Uh, but they talked about how they um, brought a car, a, a mini Cooper, they drove a mini Cooper into uh, the Russian Federation with Donetsk People's Republic plates. They drove around Moscow with Kaz Kazakhstan plates. They left, uh, fled to Estonia with Ukrainian plates. This is all caught on video in different places of the country. Uh, and I forgot to explain the other person involved in this. This woman brought her 12-year-old daughter. That Her 12-year-old daughter is, is uh, in the FSB report. And it's believed that she actually helped carry out this terrorist attack. Oh, my goodness. So, so like the, and of course, Ukraine has not confirmed or denied uh, involvement in this, but this is what it does all the time, even when it shells uh, Russian territory. It's very clear that it was uh, Ukrainian secret services. And I think it shows just the 
sheer desperation they're in right now that they have to. I mean, for what purpose did they did they want to kill Alexander Dugan? He's not mm -hmm. he's not a political uh, he's not important to the proper functioning of the Russian political system. He's mm -hmm. not a general. He's not a soldier. He's a philosopher and a, a, a political commentator. It's clearly that it's clear that Kiev is is carrying out terrorist attacks to intimidate people who are ideologically motivated to oppose what Kiev's doing. And that's exactly who Alexander Dugin is. And that's exactly who Daria was. She was also a journalist and uh, a political analyst that uh, worked very hard. I mean, and a highly we, educated philosopher herself. Yeah, highly educated. She, she, she spoke many languages. And of course, we didn't agree on everything. But what, the main thing we agreed on was that U.S. imperialism had to go, you know, yeah. and uh, she did great work. It was yeah. it's it's terrible. It's a terrible loss. I, I'm really sorry for your for your loss. Um, and, and, and it's um, it's astounding the way the Western media is already, you know, you probably haven't even seen it because it just came out. But the Guardian's already calling the FSB report um, misinformation. Um, so they're denying it. Um, but that's the guardian, um, who works closely with MI6 and that was exposed yeah. by the gray zone, um, recently. And it's, it's abhorrent, um, yeah. the way they are not giving balanced journalism. Um, these are, you know, again, trying to bend historical facts or like a police investigation in this case, uh, an intelligence investigation. Um, and I wanted to go further. Reef, could you could you show so some of the Western headlines? And I wanted you to discuss this for a minute. I don't want to show the worst ones. I'll just show this one. Um, basically, are implying that Alexander Dugan and um, Daria were simply um, Russian propagandists. Another one was was they called Alexander Putin's brain, but he had never even met Vladimir Putin. So could you expand a little bit on the facts and the fiction around all of this? Yeah, this is also something I talked about in my RT report today. The fact that the Western media was has been constantly hyping up Alexander Dugin as this kind of uh, like foreign policy advisor to Vladimir Putin, and the, and as if as if like uh, he's like some sort of high level ideological advisor in the Vladimir Putin administration. But I mean, we got to get our facts straight. Like the Kremlin has never officially identified any sort of connection with uh, with Alexander Dugan. And in Russian society, actually, he's considered a bit of like a fringe figure, like very marginal. He, he's not he's not considered nearly what the Western media make him out to be here in Russia. Um, he's kind of like a Rush Limbaugh to compare it to in the U.S. Would you say that like kind of like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, he's a little he's, bit. He, he's uh, obviously more educated and intelligent. I mean, the man is very educated yeah. <laughs> philosopher, but, you know. Yeah, he's he's like he's got a large voice in the mm -hmm. in the in the circle of intellectuals in Russia, but he's mm -hmm. not in any way connected with the Russian government. And these right. accusations that they're fascists are even more ridiculous. These are these are this is like projecting. This is some su stuff that Ukrainians that uh, say the Azov battalion is not neo-Nazi say, you know. Oh, I know. And and like, for instance, we mentioned the Guardian, they actually got caught airbrushing off the Nazi symbols of the Azov battalion from photos and got caught. Or excuse yeah. me, that was the BBC. The BBC got caught doing that. Yeah. Not the Guardian. So Following their narrative. <laughs> what? Following their narrative. They, yeah, they have to make yeah. Have I mean, if it doesn't fit world. their narrative, they make it fit, right? Yeah. And or, or they'll blur out the picture of Stephen Bandera behind some of these spokespeople from Ukraine. Um, yeah. When it's obvious. And then Vogue magazine did an article trying to rehabilitate Stephen Badera, which was mind blowing. It's unbelievable. Um, and said that he wasn't a Nazi when he, I mean, again, it's the Western, um, which is really frightening. And I think the Roman Empire tried to do this as well. They try to write their own history. And, and yeah. that's, um, you know, thinkers like Howard Zinn, um, Chomsky and others push back against this, you know, like with books like The People's History. And I think that's kind of how I viewed Alexander Dugan. He was pushing back on misperceptions in history as well. And yeah. you can find his anti-fascist videos right online. If you look up his name, he talks against fascism. You can see that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly, uh, you know, the part of what he preaches and his ideology that I'm in approval of, you know. And uh, one thing I want to say also about Stepan Bandera and Western, uh, you know, apologists for him and claims by these Ukrainians that he wasn't a, a Nazi collaborator or anything. 
I'm just I just want to say something that uh, uh, that, that I heard from a museum uh, curator and a historian when I went to Donbass and went to um, one of the main museums in the Lugansk People's Republic about their history of the Great Patriotic War. And it, he put it in very simple terms that nobody can argue with. There were no recorded battles between the Nazis and um, Stepan Bandera's groups. There were no recorded battles between them. And mm -hmm. these Ukrainian nationalists try to say that they actually fought against the Nazis. They didn't. All of right. the battles fought with partisans are recorded between Nazis and communists. And those communists came in in like over 90% from Donbass. So. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, because a lot of people just have the history muddled and um, purposefully it's being muddled by the West. Again, it's to shape this narrative to justify this proxy war the US and NATO's fighting against Russia via Ukraine. Yeah. And and I think that the narrative has been quickly falling apart um because of tragedies that you've seen in the Donbas region that are being, you know, of war crimes that Ukraine is committing and you can't yeah. deny it. And even Amnesty International has called out, of course they backtrack but then now they've you know what I mean? As trying to, they were saying they were trying to soften the language or something, but it happened. Like you can't soften yeah. the language around that, right? Of course not. I, and I, I, I don't understand. Like, you, like you're saying, I mean, it's becoming so difficult for them to try and gloss over the crimes that the Ukrainian government is committing right now. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, even if, even if you you watch the mainstream media and you buy the the idea that the ukrainians are not the ones endangering the zaporozhye at at atomic station right now even though the regional authorities there said we need to stop these ukrainian positions from firing on a nuclear power station to avoid another chernobyl even if you buy that it's just impossible to deny the fact that ukraine is turning uh, parts of Donetsk, uh, People's Republic, and specifically the capital of Donetsk into minefields. There's just no denying that they're, uh, they're shooting cluster munitions at areas that have no military targets in them, heavily populated with civilians. They're shooting mm -hmm. cluster munitions that are dropping butterfly mines all over the place. And uh, already scores and tons of people have been injured there. And, and these mines, they're banned by international law. Yes. They're banned because, and, and Ukraine was even supposed to have destroyed all of their pedal mines. They said that they did years mm -hmm. ago. And the reason for that is because these mines are not even intended to kill people. They're mm -hmm. intended to blow their, their legs off. They're, in, they're intended mm -hmm. to maim them in completely inhumane ways without killing them. And that, right. that is what the Ukrainians are doing to the, the, the Donbass people right now.